for the one second. Uh, name is Rebecca Colby. And Rebecca um, is here to come. Well, she's here with Gaia Life to go hang out. Um, and we'll be speaking very briefly on how the National Council on Disability um, has been prioritizing intersectionality uh, in their work moving forward. Um, so without further ado, we're that Hi, everyone. It's so great to be with all of you today. Um, here in the, the luxury of my basement full of laundry, which luckily oh. strategically hit it so you can't see it. Um, I want to thank Sandy and Lydia for bringing me into conversations regarding this event several months ago. And to give a special shout out to some of my loved ones in the room, Ian, Ruth Rigger, Greg Baratran, Heather Watkins, and Melissa Thompson. If I go too fast, um, I hope that one of the interpreters will signal me, wave, or make an inappropriate gesture so I know I need to slow down, um, as that tends to happen with me sometimes. In recent years, um, leaders in the disability rights movement have been treating intersectionality like it's a new thing. They act as though our history is not one of combining or looking at the combination of multiple different forms of oppression and acting as though having a single speaker of color on a conference agenda is an absolution for erasure and paternalism about diversity and inclusion. Names like Sylvia Walker, Chris Bell, Victor Barreras, Brad Lomax, Kenny Brown III, and Congressman Major Owens are just a few names of key leaders who were early on in identifying intersectional issues in the disability community. Today that work is carried on by leaders like those in the room, uh, folks like Kia Brown, Dior Vargas, Victoria Rodriguez Roldan, and others who continue to set the course going forward. And it's on those of us who are in positions of quote unquote leadership in the disability community to elevate and to center your voices, to use our privilege uh, to ensure that not only are you at the table, but that you design the table, you set the table, and you determine what the menu will be. Because if you don't set the menu, you become the menu. So the, value, the values of looking at disability issues through an intersectional lens are a fundamental piece of our work at the National Council on Disability. And I'm really excited because today happens to be our 38th birthday. So I'm celebrating the birthday of the independent federal agency known as NCD with all of you. And there is nowhere more appropriate for me to be than with all of you. As an independent agency, our job is um, advising Congress, the White House, our partner agencies, and the disability community about all issues impacting Americans with disabilities. It's a big task. And honestly, it's one that we've gotten criticized for over the years for being too broad about. But in reality, the mission of the National Council on Disability is broad and inclusive because our community is broad and diverse. I became the executive director at NCD in 2013. And I'm not going to lie, the whole thing was a bit overwhelming. Um, our previous chairperson called me up and asked me why I hadn't submitted my name uh, with others um, for candidacy for the position. And I said I could have seen myself doing it in five to ten years. And his response was that he was tired of NCD being a place where old activists went to die. <laughs> yeah, and you know Jeff Rosen, that's totally his sense of humor. Um, his vision for NCD was to reclaim its position as a voice for civil rights in the disability community to both celebrate the wins of an administration as they came our way, but to also critique the places we still had yet to go, and to always ensure that the voices of those most marginalized were the most central in the conversations that we were having. For 2017, we committed our work to the intersection of disability and poverty, 
And it's impossible to do this without looking at racism, homophobia, ableism, classism, and anti-immigrant sentiment. But I'm not just here as the head of, as the executive director of NCD. I'm also here as the daughter of Joan Hare, Disabled Students Director at the College of San Mateo, and Billy Hare, who ran a Center for Independent Living in Belmont, California. Unlike most folks with disabilities, I grew up with parents with the same disability that I have, and I now today have two children with the same disability that I have. Both my parents were little people, and though long gone now, they really instilled in me from as early an age on as possible, an understanding that we need to recognize the intersecting oppressions that so many in our movement face and so few in our movement talk about. In the early days of the AIDS virus hitting San Francisco, my dad lost a number of colleagues and, and individuals who were being receiving services at the IL. And my mom lost numerous students um, who simply one day would not be back in class. And my parents didn't just sort of shake a finger at it or, or look away at it. What they instead did was try to find out what happened to each of those students, each of those, um, each of those consumers, each of those people with disabilities. And we ended up attending a number of funerals over the years. Um, my parents were adamant that we would skip anything else we had to do if we were going to go um, you know, pay our respects for the people who had passed away from AIDS that they had relationships with, that they had friendships with, that mattered to them because somebody needed to be there. And it was important that nobody should ever be by themselves at that point in time. And I think for me, that's really where my fire on this issue comes from. And while we, you could say we've come a long way since then, we still have so far to go. Anti-AIDS rhetoric has basically been copied and pasted and rebranded as anti-autistic rhetoric. While these last eight years have been incredible in terms of the things that we were able to achieve in this administration, we also have so much further to go in terms of bringing folks to the table um, whose experiences, whose voices, and whose identities have never been centered before. I continue to think back on uh, Dr. King's statement about how anyone can be great because anyone can serve. And I encourage you all to think about ways that you can, you're serving now and can continue to serve. Um, I will never forget the day that I volunteered to review 200 videos for Asian American Heritage Month when I was working at the White House. And in that stack of 200 videos was a video by Alice Wong. And in the video, Alice talked about the stigma and the challenges in accessing personal assistance services within the Asian American community. And it blew me away because A, here was an activist from the Bay Area that I didn't know. But B, she was talking about something that no one else was talking about in Washington. And so I picked up the phone and I called her. And I quite literally had a moment sort of out of the American president and said, hi, is Alice Wong available? And she said, this is Alice. And I said, hi, my name is Rebecca Coakley, and I'm calling on behalf of the White House. Do you have any interest in serving the president? And we were so lucky that Alice said yes, um, after probably thinking it was a prank call for a good 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> Um, but Alice's dedication and commitment to ensuring that the voices of individuals with significant disabilities who use personal assistance services was at the table and was centered in the work of NCD was critical to ensuring that our work fulfilled its mission. Over my time in the White House, we, we looked at and brought together folks like Sonia Renee Taylor from the Body is Not an Apology, Anupa Iyer, um, T.L. Lewis, and others to have conversations, and particularly to have those conversations that folks outside of the community or folks outside of the room even were not comfortable having. But I think at the end of the day, that's the work of intersectionality, is how do we have those conversations that make folks uncomfortable? Because those are the ones that we so desperately need to have. When talking about the history of the ADA, there are many names that repeatedly come up in terms of uh, individuals who claim to be the father of the legislation. If my son was down here, uh, which luckily he's not, or you would hear him, 
He would claim that he wrote the ADA. <laughs> Mind you, he's six. But I think he has much as, as much of a claim as most of the other folks. Um, but the name that's very rarely mentioned as one of the fathers of the ADA is, Senator, is Congressman Major Owens, who was chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and also the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee on the Hill. Congressman Owens represented Brooklyn and had strong relationships with a number of disability rights activists um, within his district, but it was really as a result of the friendship that he grew with Justin Dart out of quite literally them meeting next to a urinal in a congressional office building um, after Justin publicly resigned uh, at a hearing about the Rehabilitation Services Administration failing to do its job adequately to ensure the full employment of people with disabilities. Justin got a memo handed to him as soon as he finished uh, giving his own testimony, as opposed to the testimony that his boss had prepared for him. And the memo simply said, your boxes are at security, your office has been cleaned out. And so Justin went to the men's room and there he ended up encountering Congressman Owens. And that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship that carried them through the passage of the signage of the ADA. However, the day that the ADA was signed, cakes were prepared for each one of the, the lead sponsors of the legislation. There was no cake for Major Owens. And it was something that hurt his feelings deeply. And so a number of us next generation leaders that came along and heard the story were notorious for repeatedly dropping off pieces of cake at his office until his wife Maria had to tell us to stop because he was hiding it and not telling her about it and nor was he supposed to be eating that much cake. <laughs> but I think it's important to recognize the folks whose stories aren't told in the mainstream stories of the disability rights movement. So we fast forward 26 years past the, the passage of the ADA and we continue to see a number of folks in the disability community that are frankly not comfortable talking about race, gender, gender identity, um, immigration status, religion. I would rather conferences like this not happen, which is frankly why I think conferences like this are so important. Individuals in our community tend to see that celebrations of the diversity of our community promote divisiveness because of the topics they bring up. And I believe that just because a conversation is hard doesn't mean we shouldn't have it. And this is a fundamental key piece of the work that we do at NCD. We work to ensure that the council's agenda always takes into account intersectional impressions. In 2016, the council received dozens of letters from folks like you, including people in the room right now, who admonished us for not doing our job as we watched repeatedly black men and women with disabilities being gunned down by police. Um, and actually, let me step back and say black people, because I want to make sure that I'm inclusive of folks of all genders. And the community was right. We weren't doing our job. And since then, we've course corrected. And in this year's work, um, we're initiating a project shortly after the first of the year to look at the interactions between law enforcement and the disability community. And within that, obviously, looking at it through an intersectional lens. Um, in our ongoing work tied to the civil rights of parents with disabilities, we were really excited to see the Office of Civil Rights and Health and Human Services issue a letter recently uh, that not only reiterated the importance of civil uh, uh, family services taking the ADA into account when looking at uh, the separation of children from their families, but also taking the Civil Rights Act into account, which is critical going forward. Our mental health project that we launched in 2016, looking at mental health in post-secondary education, is not only going to look at students with other disabilities who acquire mental health disabilities, but also specifically look at how are these needs of students with mental health disabilities being met at both minority and majority serving institutions? Are there things that we can learn from how Hispanic institutions and um, uh, historically black colleges and universities are meeting the needs 
of students with disabilities who also happen to have uh, mental health disabilities. In closing, I just want to wish you all a successful and rabble-rousing conference and a continued enthusiasm for overthrowing the status quo. I look very forward to being overthrown someday. Just wait till my kids finish college. <laughs> Uh, but thank you, thank you all for having me, and I am thrilled, uh, I was thrilled to be here today. Thank you,